Heavenly Father, that is our prayer. Lord, that you would minister to us in this time through your word. Lord, that you would conform us more into Christ's image, that you would equip us better to be useful servants for your purposes, whatever they may be. That we would humbly submit ourselves and yield to you in faith as your church so that this earth would be filled with your glory. As we walk and we live by means that are outside of our own, as we testify to your goodness, your righteousness, your love, your mercy, your grace, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified, that you would be seen as the great God that you are, and as I give testimony to your word and your faithfulness, I pray that would be what would be most impressive, impressive to us this morning would be you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we are continuing the second week of a short series that we're going through on the divine provisions of a good God. If you're new or visiting, I strongly encourage you to go to our website and listen to last, week, uh, last week's sermon, as it will give some further context for kind of what produced this series. Okay, if I put my hand in my left pocket, I have to be careful to not hit the mute button. <laughs> uh, if you go to the, the website and listen to the sermon, it'll give further context for kind of what uh, catapulted us into this series. And we're doing something a little bit different than what we, well, a lot different than what we usually do. I mean, we are a church who um, is faithful to exposit, expositional teaching of God's word. And yet the elders are allowing me and have asked me to give testimony to God's faithfulness and how he has preserved me and my family during this season. We uh, a little over five months ago now, uh, experienced a heartbreaking tragedy in the loss of our five-year-old son. My wife and I have, well, we had four children, and Caleb was our youngest. He was five, and we were vacationing at a family property up north, and as we were loading up after a wonderful week together to come home, um, I was moving our truck and I pulled forward, not knowing Caleb was in front of me, and I inadvertently uh, ran over my son, um, and he passed away quickly, which we're thankful for. We didn't know that in hindsight. And so what I've been doing in this series, what my desire is, is to highlight how God has sustained us, and he's sustained us in many ways, many, many ways. But there are divine provisions that he has brought into our lives, resources, that are unique to the Christian. Things that the world doesn't have access to. Non-believers in Christ, those who are outside of the body of Christ, simply do not have access to these provisions. And so in this series, we are highlighting these divine provisions, which I've summarized in the word of God, the body of Christ, which we'll be talking about today, and the hope of eternity. And I want to make sure that it's clear. We have been cared for so abundantly and so broadly by so many that in highlighting these divine provisions, I in no way want to minimize the other ways that the Lord has encouraged us and strengthened us and benefited us through, through the self-giving love of others. We have had neighbors who have gone above and beyond in their encouragement and care for us. There are believers outside of this local body who have just been a tremendous blessing and providing financial support and encouragement and cards and gifts. Truly astonishing all the ways that the Lord has cared for us. Family, extended family, so generous, so kind, so caring. And so I, I want to make sure it's clear that in highlighting what the Lord has done divinely through this body, I in no way am taken away from the reality that we have been ministered to outside of this body as well. But I think it's important in this context that we look particularly at the way that the Lord has sustained us through his church, the body of Christ, and particularly the body of Christ as it pertains to the local church, which is how scripture most frequently 
reflects the church as a local assembly of believers. And God has purposes behind his design that believers be connected to one another in a local assembly. And there's tremendous benefits to that. And so you came to church this morning and you're going to get to hear a sermon about how awesome you are. (laughs) This is exciting, even though the topic is sobering or what got us here is, is heartbreaking. I get to rejoice in God's goodness to us through you. So first off, thank you. Thank you so much for the love that you guys have poured out on my family. Truly could not imagine a church family coming along somebody or a family better than how you have. This morning, I want to highlight six ways that the body of Christ, and particularly you all, have encouraged us and been indispensable in our lives. Yes, indispensable in regards to our spiritual nourishment and being sustained before the Lord. Six ways we were blessed and strengthened and sustained and benefited from our local church. You guys have been exemplary in your care for us. God has been so generous to us. And really, as we think back on all of the things leading up to that event on October 12th, God was so kind. Julie and I have often reflected upon his kindness to us, even in the vacation that we had. It's rare that you have a week of undistracted time as a family right before an unexpected loss. Caleb and I, early in the trip, we had the joy of getting to make a, a run into town, into Prescott together. We drove in, we got to go to Sportsman's Warehouse, which was really fun. And for some strange reason, as we were walking to the checkout line, I saw some toys on the side and I said, hey, Caleb, pick one out. And he goes, wait, what? <laughs> Apparently that's not a normal practice that I buy my children toys, but... <laughs> In this case, I was feeling generous, and so he picked the, the cheapest, most poorly put together dart gun that they had, and he wanted it, and I bought it for him. In hindsight, it was a, a very good um, expenditure of $15 for this small piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> he used that dart gun all week to shoot spiders. I wish you all could have seen his face. There was a a day when we were at the ranch and a spider was crawling along the floor and he shot it with his dart gun. He hit it with his dart gun. It killed the spider. And it was like he had just gotten a monster elk. I mean, he was just like, yeah. He's like got his shotgun, dart gun, shotgun. He was so excited. It was so sweet. So proud. We got to go to Costco after that and get food for the family. He got a hot dog, and our five-year-old boy ate almost the whole hot dog. He was so proud. Precious memories. There was a day where Asher had a a deer tag, and we went out hunting together, and we took uh, Elijah and Caleb. They came with us, and it was so sweet. We were all dressed up in our camo, and we got in a spot, and we were sitting by water and seeing if a deer would come in, and a, uh, a group of does came in. And they came in behind us, and they got about 10 to 15 feet away from Caleb. And uh, as they were coming in, I, you know, shh, shh, his eyes started, and he could hear them. And you could see he was a little nervous, and he's looking at me like, is this okay? Then they sensed us, they started snorting at us, and his face was just, he was just on cloud nine. It was so exciting. Precious memories. We uh, were riding our our side-by-side, our family side-by-side, and uh, we pulled off to the side as a truck was coming, and there was a, a rancher in the truck, and she, um, she worked at one of the nearby ranches, and she looked at us and said, well, that looks like a good day. My response, oh, it just couldn't be better. What a gift. The Lord gave us multiple, multiple, multiple opportunities to recognize the preciousness of the moment. I'm so thankful for these things. Sunday, the day before Caleb passed away, we were watching the Cardinals games, or the Cardinals game, and Caleb came and jumped up on my lap with his little puppy that rattles like he often would, and he sat on my lap, and I sniffed his hair, and I thought, what a gift. These days won't last long. 
I loved being Caleb's dad. What a gift it was. Julie and I, as I've shared with you, uh, even acknowledged that week what a gift Caleb was. That was a regular occurrence, probably something like once or twice a week, I would tell Caleb how much I loved being his dad as well as my other kids. And Julie and I would frequently comment about just how blessed we were to have Caleb in our lives. We had had a miscarriage prior to Caleb, and so the Lord just had a, put on our heart a profound gratitude specifically for Caleb's life because we don't know if we would have had him if we hadn't experienced that loss, and we were so grateful. Julie had a puzzle buddy. Julie is amazing at puddles, at uh, puddles, puzzles. <laughs> I'm having a hard time speaking this morning. Julie's amazing at puzzles. Uh, I'm not, and Caleb loved doing puzzles. We have a couple that they did even that week. All of these experiences were such a gift from God. Each one was a, an expression of God's sovereign care and kindness to us, prepping our hearts to endure what was coming. Yet none of these significant graces even come close to the way that the Lord has used you all, this body, the body of Christ, in our life. The world would have access to precious memories, deep moments of gratitude, but the world does not have access to this. This kind of care, this kind of support, this kind of encouragement, this kind of interaction that you all are, that we are together one to another is truly divine. In one sense, you can't prepare specifically for a trial like this, and at the same time, we were actively and intentionally prepared exactly for this through all of you. And that's what I want to testify to this morning. Why? How? How does that happen? How do you ever be in a spot where you are prepared for something like this? The Lord does it, and he uses divine means, things like his word, things like the body of Christ, to work in a person, to work in individual hearts, to increase faith, to grow maturity, to create readiness for every good deed, even when you're in the midst of sorrow and pain and hurt. He prepares us. And he ministers to us. He gives us all that we need and a primary means of equipping and sustaining his children is the body of Christ. That's what I want to testify to this morning. So first, as we consider the divine provision of the body of Christ, of the local church, first we see that the body of Christ causes preparatory, preparatory growth. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Again, my outline is on the website, and on that I have the, the specific outline as well as the verses that we'll be turning to this morning. So if that's helpful for you and you're note-taking or not taking notes, those are available to you online. The body of Christ causes preparatory growth. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. Just to set the stage for us a little bit, it says, And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and then we see, and some as pastors and teachers. For what? What are the pastors and teachers for? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Pastors and teachers equip the saints for the work of service to the end of building up the body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. But what? Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, 
causes the growth of the body. You could say it this way, from whom the whole body causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. God's divine purpose and intention within the church is that there is a interconnectedness, a closeness to one another, a connectedness with one another, where God uses each individual part working as he intends in their life to cause the growth of the body. We were built up in this church. We benefited. We were prepared for this specific trial through all of you. What a gift. What a provision of the Lord. We've been built up with the church to be prepared for life's trials and hardships. We've matured in this church. We have been grown because of this body. We would have never thought to prepare for something like this, and yet we were not unprepared for this. We have been and continue to be built up in and by this church. The pastors of this church have and continue to equip this body and have been faithful to equip us for the work of service and ministry to you, to each other, and you to us. There were things that were intuitive to us that are not the defaults of the human heart. Not the defaults of the carnal man. You don't think the things that we thought. You don't say the things that we said. You don't pursue and engage in the things that we did without the faithful teaching and equipping that comes from the local church. You just cannot get there on your own. It's not God's design. It's not God's intention. He specifically designed the Christian life to be connected with other believers for one another's spiritual benefit and readiness to serve, to honor God, to be mature. Faithful shepherds who taught us to fear God, even as John is doing currently in our equipping hour, to hate sin, to pursue and cultivate holiness, to have a robust understanding of the sovereignty of God, of what scripture has to say about the character of God. Scott, year after, where are you? Year after year. I'm sure you're appreciative of me doing this right now. Year (laughs) after year, week after week of preaching God's word, of shepherding, of pastoring, of eating Marcello's Caesar chicken salads. (laughs) And bearing with me, caring for my soul, bears fruit. It prepares us. It's God's means of intimate care to build us up and prepare us for life's hardships and trials. They're coming. Many of you know that all too well as you're in them right now. I know. Not all, but I know many of the hardships that are taking place in this church. We are not the only ones who have experienced a trial. And yet God is faithful and he's caring for us intimately. And not only through the leadership, that is a significant means and we need that, it's a necessary means, but simply the body being connected to one another prepares the body for what awaits us. Imitable men and women in our lives regularly. I just want to encourage you, if you're distant from the local body, you will not be prepared for life's hardships the same way. God's supernatural means to producing maturity and readiness for ministry and growth in Christ is found in the local assembly, in the local church. We were prepared for years, teaching, being admonished, being encouraged. We saw godly examples, and this has monumental implications for our lives monumental implications for our lives. This kind of tragedy tears families apart. And not only immediate families, but extended family as well. The Lord has been so so kind. We didn't need some sort of trial-specific training. We were just active in our local church, and the Lord readied us for this. The Lord matured us 
and we are still very much in that process with much growth to be had. A testimony of this, just listen to Titus 2, verses 3 through 5. Titus 2, verses 3 through 5 says, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. After I had run over Caleb, I scooped up his body and ran to the house, crying for Julie to call 911. She called. I began to administer CPR, and as you know from last week, I'm crying out, I know God is good. I know God is good. I know God is good. As I was working on Caleb's body at one point, Julie grabbed my arm. She looked me in the eyes. And she says, I love you, and this changes nothing. Okay, Julie doesn't say very much assertively. <laughs> it's not that she's not assertive. She's just very temperate. She's very quiet, except for when it's time to go to sleep. Then she wants to have a conversation. That's God's grace to sanctify me. She's so sweet. But she looked at me, she grabbed me and said, I love you, this changes nothing. And in my sober-minded state, I cried out, this changes everything. And she said, not in regards to my love for you. Her baby was lying limp on the ground. I did it. She has been taught to love her husband. To not put contingencies on that love. The word of God was honored by my wife. She didn't get there on her own. You all participated in that. Godly women. Wellspring. <laughs> small group. Discipleship. Thank you. <laughs> my wife loves me. She's been devoted to me. There hasn't been one moment where she has blamed me. I believe it was around 14 minutes from our call when it started until the first officer arrived on the scene and a few more minutes before the paramedics arrived. We had asked our kids to wait inside as we were administering CPR when the paramedics took over attempting to revive Caleb, I went inside and spoke with our kids. I was a puddle. I was apologizing to everything in front of me. I explained that it was not looking good and that the paramedics were doing everything they could to revive Caleb. And I burst out with, I, I am so sorry. I was heartbroken more than I could have ever imagined, and one of my children promptly responded, Oh, Dad, we know it was an accident. It's not your fault. We know God is sovereign, and we can trust him with whatever happens. That sentiment was immediately, emphatically echoed from our other kids' response, We love you. We can trust God. My children, in the most intense moment of turmoil, know that God's sovereign and didn't question it. They found refuge in that, and they didn't say, hey, Caleb will be okay. Don't be so sad. No, they said, we can trust God. Their hope wasn't in the momentary circumstances of what happened with Caleb. It was in God. They did not get there on their own. You all contributed to that. If ever there was a plug for those last four spots to sign up in NGM so that we can restart, <laughs> this has got to be one of the most emotional plugs ever. <laughs> Not trying to guilt you into it, simply to testify of the fruit of it in my children's lives. 
They were taught from my wife, they were taught from me, and they were consistently hearing the same truths from all of you. What a gift. Thank you. We were prepared so well simply by week after week, people being faithful to prepare lessons that taught truth. My kids were not unfamiliar with trials. They were not unprepared. In fact, they had the benefit of watching many of you and even younger ones endure trials in this church. Our dear friends, the Dodds, thank you, younger ones, for the ways that you persevered and ministered to us, the Hantless and many others. The body of Christ causes growth, and this growth is preparatory. It prepares us for what God has in store for us. Next, the body of Christ, number two, it also provides mature pastoral care and wise counsel. This is God's intention. If your view of the body of Christ is simply the global body of Christ, you miss out big time. You've totally missed it. God has appointed some through his Holy Spirit to be pastors, elders, who are shepherding the flock, who are approved men, mature men, competent men with the truth and the ability to shepherd with the truth. This is God's intention, that the church would have and for the believer provide mature pastoral care, that there would be wise wise counsel accessible for the believer. The police officer who was first on the scene had a sweet and kind concern for me. He was so kind. I wasn't completely hysterical, but I was greatly shook. I mean, he walked in as I'm crying out, I know God is good. He undoubtedly saw the concern on my face, the tears in my eyes. At one point, he asked Julie, Is he going to be okay? Julie's immediate response, without any hesitation, was a confident, oh, I know he will. I know the man he is, and I know the men he has in his life. He has the church. He has men in his life who won't let him not be okay. That's what the church does, provides mature pastoral care, access to wise counsel, As the paramedics were working on Caleb's body, I called my brother Matt. And I called Matt not primarily because he is my brother. I have many brothers. And that was undoubtedly a significant part of it, but not the most significant part. You know why I called my brother Matt? Because he's my pastor. I needed help. I needed something far greater than a familial support, something more than emotional support. I needed pastoral care. Matt, Jenna, their whole family dropped everything that they were doing to make Matt and Jenna available to join us at the ranch. They came up, visited us, spent the night with us, encouraged us, prayed with us, cried with us, wept with us, counseled us. God was so kind that night. I don't know for how long, maybe an hour, probably more, around midnight, I spoke with my dear, precious friend, Jacob Hantla. Had him on speakerphone in our bedroom, Julie and I with Jake. He just encouraged us with truth. We sobbed together. He prayed for us. He cared for our soul. He instructed us. I still remember so vividly, so much was fuzzy in that night. And I remember so vividly his instruction, Josh, when you can't muster anything else out, when there's no words, just whatever you can do to utter, I trust. Just say it. Direct your heart, I trust. 
cry out to God, I trust. Jacob, my pastor, my friend, was a supernatural provision, as was Matt and Jenna, to, from the Lord to sustain us. I can't imagine what that first night and really every day since would be like if I didn't have that kind of pastoral care, if my family didn't have that kind of pastoral care. If I didn't have access to mature spiritual pastoral care. First Peter 5, the first part of verse 2 says, an instruction for elders, pastor elders, to shepherd the flock of God among you. My pastors were qualified and equipped. They shepherded us. Shepherded us. The next day was an elder meeting that we were supposed to have, and we asked the elders to come and sit and pray with us. As we were driving home, Matt and Jenna drove us home. Well, Matt drove us home. Jenna cleaned up the ranch and came home later. And I asked Matt, do you think it'd be possible if the elders would come and just sit with our family and, and pray with us? And of course they did. I believe this was John's first day on the job. <laughs> and he's called to come sit with my family and minister to us. He was ready. Qualified man. What he lacked in intimate acquaintance, uh, acquaintance with us, uh, he had more than enough in just godly maturity and wisdom. And he was so helpful. All the elders were so helpful. They just came and sat with us and we shared what had happened from us. They had heard already, obviously. And we asked for prayer. I think I had put together a list of, I don't know, a handful of things that I was sharing that I thought our family would need help from and input regarding. Every single elder was meaningful and shared and was encouraging. John spoke intimately to our greatest struggle in that moment, which was, I don't think a surprise to anybody, feeling guilt over the fact that I had done it. John said, I wish I knew you better. I wish I could speak more intimately and personally to you as a brother but friend, and he went on to explain how guilt is a failure to adhere to or meet God's standard or expectation, and brother, God doesn't expect you to be omniscient. Therefore, there is no guilt for you in this situation. I just thought, man, what if he did know me intimately? <laughs> I mean, this was awesome. It was so helpful. Julie said shortly, like immediately after they left, well, I don't know if I, I, I know I don't get a say in this and you've already hired him, but he, he passed my interview process. <laughs> All the elders benefited us tremendously. So precious, so helpful, so Godward, so sanctifying. Just listen for a moment to what God has to say about the benefit of wise counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. And again, these references are all on the website. 12, verse 15, Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Chapter 15, verse 22, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. Proverbs 19, 20, listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. Proverbs 24, 6, for by wise guidance you will wage war and in abundance of counselors there is victory. Proverbs 28, 26, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. Do you think God likes to use wise counsel in his people's lives? Of course he does. And in the local assembly of believers, there are men who have been affirmed as godly and competent with God's word to both know God's word and shepherd with it and have character that is exemplary in it to care for the flock. And I'm a pastor and I desperately needed my pastors, right? Being a pastor doesn't graduate you from that need. We all have that need. And we all should be eager and quick to not trust ourselves, 
to humble ourselves, to seek input, to seek counsel. Job had poor counselors. I'm not Job by any sense of the imagination, but I praise God because I have such wonderful counselors. We wanted their input on everything. Everything was on the table in that moment. My eldering, guys, if I need to step out, if, if somehow this disqualified me, I didn't know which way was up or down. So I said all sorts of crazy things. But <laughs> if, if, if I shouldn't be a pastor, if I've brought reproach on Christ in any way or this church, remove me. My ministry, my family, the care for my family, man, whatever, whatever, just help. They were so quick to provide so much help. There was a significant blessing in being near our elders, our pastors. But the benefit of the church extended far beyond the pastors only. The entire body of Christ jumped into action, catapulted into care for us. And that leads to number three, the next observation I want to point out regarding the body of Christ and how God used it is this, the body of Christ imparts intimate help in bearing trials and sorrows. We were loved so well. We saw that the the body of Christ imparts intimate help in bearing trials and sorrows. Uh, We put no restrictions on who would share what and to whom or even really what to share. The church went to work and went to action. People were sharing, passing on the news, and texts started pouring in, phone calls. We were being prayed for immediately and actively. When we got home that next morning, this happened late in the afternoon on Monday. We got home early in the afternoon around lunchtime on Tuesday. Our fridge was full, both of them. Our garage fridge, our kitchen fridge was packed. And it was full of things we like. (laughs) People know us. They know what we eat. So there was lots of meat. (laughs) Wonderful meals were being brought to us. We received so many cards, all meaningful. But you know what? There was a distinct personalization in the cards that were from those who share the intimacy of being in the same church body that doesn't diminish the sweetness of the care from those outside of our body. But receiving cards and messages from you all, who I see every week, interact with regularly, there was a sweet intimacy there that the Lord used profoundly to minister to us and still does. Our small group, The Frazies, the Laymans, everybody, everybody in our small group, every category of need was met beyond what we could have imagined. The intimate care. I could speak for hours simply on the care that we received from our small group alone. Knowing the difficulty of holidays. Thanksgiving, the first holiday we experienced, our small group put together a a beautiful basket of personalized gifts that were so thoughtful and meaningful, and they made a wreath that had feathers, and on each feather were things that they were thankful for about Caleb from their family. They couldn't take away that Thanksgiving was hard, but they added a profound sweetness in such a wonderful way. They did a 12 days of Christmas thing where miraculously to us, gifts arrived on our front uh, step leading up to Christmas every night. It was so sweet as oftentimes the evenings were most difficult as things started to settle down and it gave us something to look forward to and each gift was so personalized and intentional. It climaxed on the last night before Christmas with pounds and pounds of beef. (laughs) Ribeye steaks. 
You don't get that kind of intimate care somewhere outside of the church, okay? <laughs> That's how our, well our small group knows us. Or at least knows what I'm willing to put on my grill. <laughs> the first Sunday after Caleb passed away, we came to church. <sighs> Listen, Julie and I, our entire adult life, have planned our life around faithful participation in the church. Not planning church around our life. You get the difference? We planned our life around faithful participation in the church. We didn't plan church around our life. There has to be something very significant for us to miss Sunday worship or small group or to not have regular interaction in the body. This benefited us so much because of the intimate nature of our fellowship with you all. When things emotionally were most difficult to come and be around people, our, our hearts actually craved it. Even the sentiment as Peter, where else would I go, Lord, than to draw near to Christ? For us, where else would we know where else would we go than to draw near to our local body where we most tangibly get to see Christ at work and be taught Christ, encouraged in Christ? What if we had conditioned ourselves that body life was negotiable? What if we allowed ourselves to always have a reasonable excuse to not be connected intentionally to the local church? Do you think at that moment when our trial was fiercest, when our emotions were most intense, that all of a sudden we would have started doing something that we so easily compromised before? That's very, very presumptuous on the grace of God. Julie and I talked about whether or not we would come to church. We absolutely felt the freedom to stay home. It would not have been sin to us if we had not come and we spoke about it as a family. We asked our kids how they felt about it, not because they were going to make the decision, but we wanted to know how they felt and how we would need to shepherd and think about it. And the overwhelming conclusion of all of us was, we want to be here. Why would we not? Where else would we go? What would be better with that time than being with you all? What would the Lord be more pleased to use to encourage us and strengthen us and sustain us and console us than his bride, which he died for. And so we said, okay, we're going to get ready and we're going to make an attempt to go. And you know what? If we're sobbing uncontroll uncontrollably in the car, in the driveway, we might make the decision to stay home at that point if we thought that we would be some sort of distraction or hindrance to the body. And if we get to the church and that starts to happen, we'll go home. And if we get in the doors and that starts to happen, we'll go home. We have freedom in this. But no, what, what's right? Let's press forward in what we think is best. And we were so, so blessed. We were physically exhausted afterwards, but we were spiritually renewed. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You have to be willing to be wept with. You hear that? You can't shut yourself down and distance yourself from God's means of grace in your life simply because you don't want to in that moment. You have an obligation before the Lord in your sorrows to be near to the body so that you can be wept with. We have an obligation to rejoice with one another, to weep with one another. And there's a beautiful reality in this corporate nature of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, we know that says, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You all suffered with us and continue to so well. Thank you. That worship service was devoted to care for us and right thinking about God's sovereignty and the loss of a loved one. We extended the service. You all did that and sang seven more songs, rejoicing and reflecting on the goodness of God and the trustworthiness of God. 
You instructed us. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. We could not even sing that day more than maybe a couple words before we would get choked up. And you all sang to us. And you encouraged us. And you know what? Where there was temptation to wrong thinking, you admonished us. You exemplified thankfulness to God for us. The hugs, the tears, the facial expressions. One in particular, a dear brother that I've had the privilege of knowing for almost two decades and served with regularly. Mid-service, walked by me. It wasn't the time for us to embrace. And as he walked by me, his lip was quivering. He couldn't look at me. It wasn't time yet. But just to see the sorrow on his face, he shared in our suffering. The memorial service for Caleb have to be honest, while people were serving us, it, it wasn't really what we asked for. We asked for things to be done a certain way, and it was done differently than we had asked. Our small group was a big part of that. It was so, 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 so much better. Above and beyond every detail, details we didn't know to ask for, were tended to with intimate care and knowledge of us, with emphasis on the things that are special to us and important to us, little scripture verses put on flowers, on boxes of food for us to have so that we could stay appropriately fed and nourished during that time in the midst of emotional turmoil. God's word was just everywhere and what was happening if this body did not know us, it would have been differently. If we ran to the body from a distance, at the moment of trial, the level of care, the level of intimacy of our care would have been so different. Many, many examples such as this. While the body of Christ is a divine means of care for the believer, there is a, a very real temptation to want to be reclusive, to, to want to shrink back. And this goes back to not letting what is hard dictate what is right. Hard isn't bad. What's right before the Lord? God was completely sovereign over our salvation years and years ago. He is sovereign over every event. He was sovereign over every event that took place the day that Caleb passed away. And he is no less sovereign in the care that the church provides to hurting individuals. Which means that our reason for engaging in that care is not contingent upon the perfect nature of that care, but the perfect nature of God who ordains things this way. And so Julie and I resolved, we are not going to set up expectations or dictate what our care must look like from our church body. We are going to trust the Lord. And he was so faithful through all of you. Number four, the body of Christ displays tangible evidence of God's wisdom. Tangible evidence of God's wisdom. We get to see God's wisdom displayed in this church as we watch him do things through our trial. There is such a comfort that comes from that. The reciprocal nature of care in the body that originates out of God is truly profound. 2 Corinthians 1, 
verses three through five. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abounding through Christ. Christ comforts you, you comfort me, I'm comforted by Christ through you, and I can comfort somebody else, and now I'm the means of Christ's comfort for somebody else as I comfort with the comfort that I've received. That wasn't in my notes, don't ask me to say it again. God's using this. What an encouragement that we so closely and so immediately see the fruit of God's wisdom through tragedy, in the midst of tragedy, as he grows us and strengthens us and comforts us and makes us more humble and dependent upon him. These are all wonderful graces that the Lord uses to encourage and sustain us in our trial, to know that Caleb's passing was not in vain and to see that tangibly immediately People we know and love are being sanctified and strengthened and grown in the Lord as a result of this. That is the greatest encouragement for us. And this encouragement comes, we see this display of tangible evidences of God's wisdom, and we find that this actually gives sustained encouragement. That's number five. The body of Christ gives sustained encouragement. There's a regular nearness that sustains and strengthens us. This road is a hard one. It is a long one. I don't know that I'll ever feel reprieve from the weight of the reality that I ran over my son. That's my lot. I trust the Lord with that. And his provision in bearing that lot is so generous and so abundant in all of you, in this church. God has been so generous. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13, take care, brethren, that there not be any of you, any one of you, an, un, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. God's divine provision for sustaining us in our faith is the body of Christ encouraging, strengthening, your encouragement, Grace Bible Church, is a divine means of guarding me and my wife, of keeping us from being hardened by sin's deceitfulness, that we would not fall away from the living God. You are God's providential means to sustaining us in the faith. Your encouragement. We don't have to walk this road alone. My small group gets to hear me cry and talk about where my heart is at every week, and I tell them, someday I'll be able to talk about Caleb without crying. Maybe on the other side of this life. But either way, they're bearing with me and they're encouraging me. I sat with, with Sarah Demaris and Chris Evans as we're working on a study together, and they are always so compassionate and so caring and they sit down, and with a, a mother's intuition, intuition, Sarah goes, Josh, how are you doing today? It was on the heels of a pretty emotional night, just deeply missing Caleb, and I just... <laughs> lost it. That kind of care, that love that comes with proximity to the body. You have to be with one another. And the Lord uses it profoundly. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, I taught it at the beginning of last year. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another toward loving good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of son, uh, some, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Just because you're going through a trial or a hardship is not an excuse to disobedience to the regular active participation in the gathering of the body of Christ. All the more necessary. Lastly, the body of Christ presents context for life beyond ourself. One of the biggest challenges in the midst of a trial 
is to have narrow vision. And all you start to do is think about yourself and your hardship and your difficulty and why aren't people tending to me the way that I need and they're not meeting my expectations and this is so hard for me. Nobody understands what I'm going through. That's the temptation. But we are part of a body. There is context beyond us alone to what God is doing. We're connected with one another. Your trials are not an excuse to fix your eyes on yourself. Romans 12, verses 5 through the first part of 6. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. We are part of the body. We can't shrink back away from the body. We are individually members of one another. And in our trial, we don't become reclusive. We don't separate ourselves. It's not an excuse to think more about ourselves. Philippians 2, 3, and 4, and 5 still stand that we are to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Even our sorrow is not to be done in selfishness. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. His self-giving love led to the most severe trial in his life, and he did not waver in it. In our most severe trials, it is not an excuse to take our eyes off of one another and fix them on ourselves. It is occasion to continue in what God calls us to be, which is selfless love giving for others. And so we serve when it's hard. We're transparent when it's emotional. We encourage, we think outside of ourselves. And this is a divine provision of God, of his goodness. It is an expression Well, these divine provisions of God, they are not to be exercised only when life is hard. This is God's design for the Christian. The title of this series is The Divine Provisions of a Good God, not the divine provisions of a good God when in the face of trials. His word, this church, the body of Christ, whatever church you're a part of, is a divine provision of God for you to step forward in faithfulness with whatever your lot is. Don't squander it. Embrace it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wisdom in salvation and how you have made a way through Christ and his death, his crucifixion, and his resurrection for us to be reconciled to you, but we thank you also for the fruit of that that creates a a reconciling one to another, that you save us from our sins and you save us to yourself and to the body of Christ, your bride, and that you have purpose in that. You have purpose individually in each one of us to produce the things that you love to produce in your children. And you have purpose in us corporately to bring glory to your name. To make disciples. For the gospel to go forth actively in intentional proclamation and in faithful living and godliness. This is a privilege for us. It may at times feel like a burden or feel difficulty, uh, feel difficult to draw near, to be transparent, to confess sins, to allow access to the intimate parts of our life, and yet it is your divine goodness on display that we would be part of the church. So Lord, help us be faithful. Thank you so much for the faithfulness of this church and how you have used used it to minister to us in supernatural ways. We give all glory to you when we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.